So also one of the things we do is we do unit checks, which is sounds stupid, but of course. But this is something else that, that, that is I think you guys will find useful. We really adhere to significant digits. And, and it's we really chop things down. Um, one of the things that if we're doing an, a stress analysis, we'll, we'll take the material card and, and cut it down to bare bones, meaning we only use the values that we know are directly in the analysis. For stress, all you're doing is Young's modules, Poissons. We get rid of everything else that we're not using. The mass density, if you're using it for vibration, here. And this is where I need to clean this up because we have too many significant digits and our density value, it's, it's out at 7.33145. Um, for FEA work, you're lucky if you're at three significant digits. And, and the way I think of it, one significant digit is 10%, and two significant digits is 1%, and three significant digits is more or less 0.1%. I mean, heck, you're lucky. You're lucky to have two significant digits a lot on FEA work. So we really cut things down. And that's attention to detail. Um, you know what you're doing, or at least you appear to know what you're doing. So, and we also use long names, descriptive load names. So that somebody follows us, looks at it, goes, oh, that's what they're doing. Yeah, and it does take more time to set up the model. I mean, this thing, doing the long names, yeah, but significant digits doesn't. It, it, it just really helps you check your model. And... When I say one of the things we do for checking, I don't know if you guys have seen this. It's, um, again, Adrian covered it. Is that there's this little tool here where you can measure your model. This says 250 inches. And it's GFS measure tool. You can download it. It's a little API. And i got to pick locate. So you can measure things on your model. And these are text boxes, and so you can change color, sizes, whatever you want. So we, in our engineering reports, we always pull up the model, and we do something dorky like this. We throw a dimension on it. It can save your ass. Uh, never assume too much. And so it's nice to, to measure right on the model. It's, it's the ultimate check. And then you put it in the report. And then that way uh, you can check it also whoever's reading your report can go, oh, that's how they did it. Um, we also always do a sum, sum of forces and sum of masses. They're also always in the report. They're coming out of feedback and checking. And one of the things that was added in the, in the later release is that now if you have a body load, you know, a body load being applied, it will, it will calculate the amount of force from that body load given the mass of the structure, which is quite nice. Before that, you'd have to take the mass and, and you'd open up the FL6 file and pull it out of the SPC reaction forces. So, analysis checkout. Because if you've gone through all your modeling to this stage, we're now at the point that you're ready to run something. Now you want to check your results. And I use this phrase a lot. All models are wrong, but some models are useful. Because it's an idealization. It's not reality. And uh, there's a difference also between verification and validation. When you verify your model, that's what we're doing when we're, we're checking the dimensions or we're checking the loads. We're verifying that, it, that it's right against an independent we would like to say independent check. For example, we take the dimension of the model, say, okay, it's 250. We look up the drawing. <laughs> we say, ah, okay, the drawing says it's close. It's like 252 or something. Okay, that's verification. Validation is that you have an experiment. You have reality. And it's the mechanical performance of the structure. So, And I, lied, lied, I heard this other phrase from an engineer. Is that a validated model is gold. Because once it's validated, it's it's on. It's it's a beautiful thing. So, how do we? What's our next step? So, when I'm looking at at stresses on my model, 
a comment I will say is, you know, it looks good. It is good because it, it, stress flows. It has to be smooth. It has to run. So, and and that's just the nature of the beast. It's it's where you have a load applied, you look for a load line. You look for a load going to the constraints. And that's something that sounds very trivial, but a lot of people, it's when you build a, get into the modeling, sometimes you lose track of that. There's the very much of the elegant simplicity that you apply a load, you look for the constraints, you gotta have a load line. Stresses flow from the application point to the constraint point. That simple. And you don't need a fancy explanation. You should be able to explain it quite simply. Because models are basically simple. And this is my this is my question that when you take a new engineer, it says, how are stress computed? What's going on? So I cover that in this other little paper and, and it's a seminar too. I've been doing, ever since FEMAP has updated their free body diagram tool, the FBD, I've been doing, it's before, it was just too painful to use. I was just like, oh, I'm not going to bother. Um, and now with FBT, FBD, every model, every everything that comes out uh, from, from our work product will have an FBD on it. And I don't get too complicated on them. I mean, I really... I view a lot of these checks, if you make them too complex, you're not going to do them. Uh, you're going to say, oh, it's fine, don't bother. The, the, real, the real trick is how simple you can make all your checks. You know, can, can you do them in a couple minutes and be done? And, and that's why, I, I, like on the free body diagram, is that, we, again, there's a whole other seminar on it. For just looking at reaction forces, it's really simple. You don't have to do much. I mean, when you look at, when you're talking about reaction loads and you want to plot it at somewhere else, okay, and all you're doing is you're summing all the reaction loads at your nodes and you're done. And then you set the colors and you pin it any location you want. It's, it's really not that hard. Um, or you can do your base like that. And I got to go up here, look at free body, turn on base like that. I can turn off interface like that. I can turn them both on. But to actually to set it up, new free body, interface. And I like to do the interface because it sums everything. And only thing I wrote out on this is reaction on it. Like that and excuse me I'm gonna go up I want to turn off my my other two like that and I need to make an interface I pick all the nodes and I'm gonna hit no because I want to make it I actually want to put it in my own location that's one of the things you can do you can pick your location I can pick a node right there and minus I a thousand in the X. And that's it. These are of course the component loads that you're seeing down there. You can turn them off. And this is what you would expect. Uh, I'd be, it's being accelerated, horizontal acceleration in one direction. It has to sum like that. And that is the beauty of, of doing the free body diagram. It provides you an independent check of what's been solved. And you can visualize it. It's really handy. So. For those doing vibration, mass and constraints is everything. And I always, I, I do look at the FL6. Typically, if I'm doing linear static analysis, I, I don't <laughs> that much anymore because uh, I got the free body diagram. I'd rather use that to check uh, instead of looking at the FL6. For vibration, I still look at the, the FL6 because it has the, 
the mass point generator. Um, and sometimes the vibration is just, I feel it's a little bit sneakier, and I like looking at the FL6. And we have a whole other seminar in normal modes if you're getting into it. And there's also this white paper to it. And for you guys that might have wondered, this little dialog box, it always comes up when you're doing an analysis. Manage, edit. This thing right here, model check. Well, that it's what it's really doing is checking your stiffness matrix. It's checking all the K terms. And early on, I, I said, why do we check the Jacobian? Is one is you want to make sure you don't have any really bad elements because it can ill condition the stiffness matrix. And what this model check does is it it goes through and checks the reasonableness of that stiffness matrix and. Oh, I, I honestly, I I've never I've never done it. Um, I've always wondered about it. I said, Adrian, you know, we should dig into this and figure out it must be there for a good reason. And I dug into it and went, oh, that is useful. Where it's really keyed in is for satellite analysis. If you have a structure floating in space unconstrained, and you do a vibration analysis on it, um, everything. It, it's all about the stiffness matrix and, and how well defined it is. And the ground check allows you to check the robustness of that matrix to make sure you don't have anything, any hidden constraints due to poorly conditioned elements. And I call it, if you're doing aerospace work, I'm sure there, there might be somebody that reviewed your model that might say, have you done a ground check? That's what would be my suspicion. I'd be curious if any of you guys out there have had experiences using ground check. but. Uh, it's there as what it's, if we have a, a satellite again in space, I know I'll be using the ground check on it. 